Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another movie night review. I'm super excited about this episode because this is a movie that uh, I wanted to talk about for a long time. Before I get into it, let me just say, check out NaturallySilkySoap.com. This is the only soap that I use. Uh, you can get a subscription box or you can just buy it outright. And if you use my promo code SGK or just let them know that I sent you, then you will get a special gift. Who doesn't want a special gift? Let's get into the review. Here we go. So this year has been quite the year for Christian movies, and it's only halfway done. Who knows what we got coming up? We had Paul, God's Not Dead 3, and of course, I Can Only Imagine. Everybody apparently loved it, and I, um, well, uh, I didn't quite, I didn't quite. As time has gone on, uh, I have not quite even more than I didn't quite when I first saw it. It's an emotion-driven Christian music industry biopic, or biopic, so I think it's biopic, I would say that, because it's biographical picture. I'm gonna say biopic, I'm sorry, everybody. It's about the song of the same name, I can only imagine. And the song, I admit, is powerful, it's catchy, it's emotional, like the movie, and it's about as overplayed as Christmas shoes. But unlike Christmas shoes, which we can typically avoid thinking about for most of the year, unless somebody in a review just decides to bring it up or something like that, I can only imagine is the heart-tugging tearjerker that just won't go away. Seriously, I remember back in my youth group days, everybody was talking about the song. This is Kevin, you gotta listen to the song. It's so fantastic. It's important, Kevin. And then, about two years later, they started playing it on just regular radio. You couldn't escape it. Oh, oh, can you believe it? There's a song with Jesus in the lyrics being played on secular radio. This was a time when everybody was talking about Jesus and faith and patriotism because it was right after 9-11. That wasn't that crazy to have a Christian song on secular radio. In fact, a bunch of Christian bands during this time got signed to secular record labels. It was a thing that was happening. But now, just when I thought that everybody had finally forgotten about the song. This movie comes along and people are tricked into thinking that it's a good movie just like they were with the song back in the day. It's crazy. Boy, that was a long rant. Oof. We better hurry it along because the movie just came out on DVD and if I don't put it out quick then Cinema Snob will put out his review and everybody will accuse me of stealing his jokes. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Cinema Snob? What? What? Yeah, that's right. I may be a snob, but I am not above appearing in a random person's channel to defend my honor. Now look, I let it go when you said I ripped off Jesus Bro from Let There Be Light. It also happens to be the movie that inspired Cinema Snob's Jesus Bro, from what I understand. Which I clearly did not. Our movie came out first, otherwise I would have ripped off a lot more from Let There Be Light. And then I let it go when you used all my jokes for old fashion. But this is strike three. But, but I didn't steal your jokes. Uh, aren't you literally doing the thing to me that you just accused me of doing to you? Yeah, doesn't feel too good, does it? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just didn't, I didn't think you'd ever hear about it because I'm, I'm kind of a small channel and you get way more views than me. Look, ripping apart awful Christian movies is a pretty tight niche. You gotta be a stupid person to dedicate an entire channel to making fun of movies that are only known by the audience who like them. Huh, I... I guess you're right. I, I guess we're kind of a, an elite group. I bet there's even fewer people who can stomach actually sitting through these movies. I down an entire bottle of Pepto before each film to prepare. What? <laughs> Me too. That's amazing. Sure. You know, it, it's really good to know that there's somebody else out there who gets where I'm coming from. Sometimes I feel totally alone in my opinions, especially a movie like this. I mean, ugh. my Facebook feed is completely flooded with people worshiping this, this hunk of garbage. People are telling me it's such an important movie that I have to go see it and that I have to like it and that I can't criticize it and that I have to honor the embargo. I mean, come on, right? Hmm, I have a feeling we have a very different set of friends on Facebook. And from what I can remember, I didn't think this movie was that bad. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? We're talking about the same movie here, right? This, this film is relentlessly emotionally manipulative. Every tiny little decision that they made in making this film seems like a marketing move. And it worked. It made $83 million at the box office. That's insane. All because everybody was like, no, 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 you have to go see this. You gotta go see the movie. It's too important to not go see this movie. This is the future. That doesn't 
sway you in any way? Look, I'm not saying I loved it, but having seen some of the other atheist bash fest Christian victim cornball sacks of crap, this one was refreshing. Okay, so what you're saying is, after years of desensitization and deteriorating standards, this movie is actually palatable to you. Yeah, oh, high praise, buddy. Look, I'm just saying it's fine. And I'm saying it's not fine. Wait, are, are we about to do a collaboration review? Certainly feels like it. Well, I'm, I'm finally doing a thing that the YouTube Creator Academy notifications are always telling me to do. But seriously, you better hurry up. I could drop a review for this movie any second. Oh, all right. Well, then uh, there is only one way that we are going to figure out if this movie is the greatest film of all time, like my friends on Facebook seem to think. That is, of course, to jump right into it. So grab your popcorn and get ready for my movie night review of I Can Only Imagine. You talking to me? Not really a popcorn guy. I sneak caviar into the theater. What? No, I'm... I'm talking to the viewer. I'm introducing the show. That's... Do you not do that? Oh, right. Got it. All right, so the movie starts off letting us know exactly why we're here to see this movie. In case you didn't know why you came here, it is because it is the song you know, the story you don't. I'm surprised they didn't change this for the DVD to include the box office numbers, too. You know, I'd honestly like to see the data on this, please. Well, I guess when you play the same song 24-7 on every radio station, you're bound to inspire some people. You know, you're right. I think the song playing so much on the radio when I was in high school actually inspired me to get my CD player fixed. So, um, mission accomplished. So we just gonna riff on this one opening line the whole time? Or are we gonna actually start watching the movie? Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on pointless details. It's kind of, it's kind of a thing that I do. Oh, I am so sick of these sitcoms with the canned laugh tracks. I mean, it, with this, they're not even trying. You can see the seats are empty. All right, so the movie opens up with Seth Rogen playing the piano. As we listen to Amy Grant go on and on and on about how this main character is just, he's so awesome. I found a song and I just kept wondering who could write this? What did they have to go through to be able to give this gift to me? Guys, seriously, the uh, lead singer of this mediocre Christian band is totally awesome. His story is amazing. It's totally justified for us to make a movie about it. We're not just trying to cash in on the success of the song. We we promise. Kevin, there have been three God's Not Dead movies, a Christmas Shoes movie, and a Christian Mingle movie based on the dating side of the same name. And you're gonna complain about this one? Hey man. I've complained plenty about those movies, too. It's an amazing song. Wait, so who was she talking to before when she was going on and on about how awesome the author of the song is? She's sitting there talking to him right here. Was that the same conversation? Was she, is she just telling him, Bart is an amazing guy? Look, Kevin, you can't ask too many logical questions about this movie. Just open your heart and let the spirit move. Or whatever. Lyrics took about 10 minutes, I guess. Music took about the same. You didn't write this song in 10 minutes. It took a lifetime. So the actual author of the song is like, yeah, the song, it, it really just took me 10 minutes to write. But fake Amy Grant here, Famy Grant, says, no, this song is so slam packed with emotional goodies, it had to have taken a lifetime to write this. It, it needs to, it's too important. I need this song to be important. Took a lifetime. Hmm, I guess that narrative does work a lot better, especially if I want to option it out as a movie. Man, this movie wants so hard to pretend like we don't already know that this is Amy Grant. It doesn't show her face or anything, but we know. It was in the trailer. How'd you do this? I, I can only imagine. You. So we cut to 19, 19. 1985. Look, I don't know what kind of movie lover makes a Bowling for Soup reference before Back to the Future, but you're on thin ice. So we catch up with young Bart, who is blowing his grandmother's leaves, and I guess just staring up into the sky. Mercy me, you've been out here all day. <laughs> That's a great reference. Great subtle reference there. That's almost as good as whatever Han Solo said. I've got a good feeling about this. How do I do? Oh. You've done good, Bart. You've done real good. You know, I'm actually kind of excited that we get to see the origins of Bart being told that his crappy work is better than it really is. 
Well, it wouldn't be the 80s if we didn't have an 80s rock song or a kid riding a bike. Though technically, I do think this song came out in 1979, but uh, yeah. Anyway, Bart heads over to this junk pile or something where they've got some nice goodies for him. Dang, is that a filter queen? That is a good find. My dad used to sell those. We know it's 1985, but come to the theater for a special showing of Jaws 3D because Dennis Quaid's in town. Then Bart rides his bike over to the music store that closes at three o'clock in the afternoon. Well, what kind of capitalist would I be if I didn't open the door in order to take this poor little kid's money? And hey, the movie doesn't want you to forget that Bart loves music because he grows up to be a musician. How is that a criticism? They are just establishing a character. Fine. Come on, man. Are you going to call me out every time I give a bad criticism? That's going to make it really difficult to do this review. Plus, what are people going to leave in the comments? Without the song, you know, it's, it's all about the song. Yeah. Doesn't matter yeah. what band. You're literally making no sense at all. <laughs> Look, we paid for the Electric Light Orchestra song. We're going to play the whole thing. So Bart heads home to see that Dennis Quaid is there being an a-hole. Because he used to be a football player and he lost his dream, as made evident by these pictures from when Bart's dad starred in Everybody's All-American. It's a fighter helmet that I made during a big battle in space. You should have worked hard on that, didn't you? But it turns out Bart's dad hates space helmets and doesn't believe Bart has the right stuff. What's this? It's just, it's just junk. Well, can I burn it? Dreams don't pay the bills. All it does is keep you from all this. Sounds pretty good to me. All right, so, I know that they're trying to make the dad out to be a bad guy here, and he is, he's a jerk. But honestly, he's he's not wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, he's just giving him life lessons to say, hey, you know, life doesn't always turn out so great and you might wanna have a backup plan. You could be nicer. It's just not guaranteed that you're gonna get paid for doing your dreams. You know, movie Bart here, does have to start preparing for the real world at some point. Yeah, you can't just grow up thinking that you're gonna do something creative, like singing or making YouTube videos. <laughs> Get real! So then Bart's mom takes him to Camp Mana <laughs> to get away from his abusive father. Not something to laugh about, sorry. You know I love you, right? I do, but if you ever prove otherwise, then I'll make you look really bad in the movie they make about me. So if you didn't bring your journals, Come up here, we got one for you. You're gonna need it for your session tonight. And keep those journals close, cause you never know when you might get the inspiration to write a number one hit Christian song. Oh, is that like a diary or? Uh, kind of, but there's more to it. Helps to get my thoughts ordered. Prayers, problems, dreams, stuff I imagine sometimes. You know, stuff kids never say, but grown-ups write for kids to say in movies. Yeah. Well, later that night, Bart and his buddy sneak out to go meet with the girl. So, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. I'm trying to decide whether I want to be in a Christian band or just want to be a Christian in a band. We're going to get in so much trouble for this. I know. So, Bart and Shannon, that's the girl's name, they have some alone time. And I know what you're thinking. Where are the grown-ups in all this? Well, <laughs> it's the 80s, all right? Then she says something that Christians are only okay with because they do actually end up getting married. I think that someday we're gonna fall in love, get married, and that's our destiny. Uh, I I didn't read ahead in the script. Is that what happens? Ugh, fireworks. They ha they did it. Get your head out of the gutter, Kevin. Fireworks don't always symbolize sex. This isn't a Disney movie. <laughs> So after camp, Bart comes home to this really, really sad situation. Where's mama? She ran off, she ain't coming back. Just you and me now. I, I, I'll admit this is a pretty sad moment. Oh, so you do have a heart. Telling a kid to give up on his dreams is fine with you. I can't believe you're so brave to admit that a kid being abandoned by his mom makes you feel something. So did you ever see her again? Um, I tried to live with her once, but she was in another bad relationship. Wow, his mom sounds like a terrible, disgusting person. Sure hope this movie isn't exaggerating for the sake of the story, because then I would feel really bad for the real mom. <laughs> you know, I never realized how much time Amy Grant had on her hands. I tried to get good at the only thing my dad really cared about. Good luck. So now it's 1991 and we go to Bart's high school and look, all his camp friends are here. Ho -ho! Dude, seriously, that beard makes you look 35. Kent, shut up. <laughs> shut up. 
All right, movie. Okay, you did it. Now I can't point out the fact that this high school guy looks like he's 35 since the movie has already done it for me. It doesn't make the movie good. It's just one less thing that I could criticize. Good job. I love you. I know. I sat there pondering, wondering, had this movie earned the Star Wars reference? Is it even worth pointing out with so many other stupid things that I needed to get to? I decided at that moment, it wasn't worth it. I had to move on. Now that Bart's playing football, his dad decides to give him some friendly football advice. To get you down on the ground, how many did it take? Nobody could never bring me down. Life hits me, I hit back harder. You understand? You get down too easy, that's your problem. But just when Bart thought that his football career was taking off, that's when it takes a major hit. Literally. <laughs> Oh no, the bombs from Saving Private Ryan just went off! Oh man, what a tragedy. Not his broken ankles, this audio adrenaline song. Well, that's disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So now that Bart's not gonna be able to prove to his dad that he's a man with football, he decides to go meet with the lady from War Room. You see? No. Nope. Sugar, what is your name? Uh, Bart. Our new assistant technical director. All right, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but Bart picks up pretty quick. Wow, big nod to Stephen Curtis Chapman here. Who? Ah yes, one of the many people this movie tries to nonchalantly play off as super important, but if you're outside of the Christian bubble, you'll have no idea who it is. But aren't those people important to Bart? They are just part of the story. Yeah, that's fine, but it, isn't it kind of unrelatable? Just saying. Whoa, whoa, this is the great All right, so because of awesome Bart's awesome, amazing singing, he gets cast as the lead in the school musical. Way to go, Miller. La. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Millard. La. Forget what Bart's dad did to him. This kid is savage. <laughs> Oh, man. But Bart isn't so keen on being in the play. <laughs> what are you trying to do to me? I can't do this. There is no way ever at all ever that you are going to get me on that stage. What do you think's going to happen next? Leave your guesses in the comments below. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. And people just can't freaking believe how amazing the lead singer of Mercy Me is. Mercy Me, that can't be his real voice. We'll punch a monkey's uncle. Awesome! All hail Bart! You have the greatest voice of all time. It's so remarkable, it's amazing! Praise Bart from whom all blessings flow. The movie is about him though. He is supposed to be the main focus. Yeah, but the filmmakers seem to love him so much. It's like he doesn't have any character flaws. He's just, oh, Bart, oh, he's so great. He does. He's selfish and cares more about himself. Plus, he has to learn to forgive his dad. Whoa, dude, whoa, spoilers. They haven't made that part of his character yet. This just now came to me because this entire time, I thought we were talking about fireproof. So, as you might expect, juxtaposed with him singing his amazing, awesome singing, his dad gets sick while he's at this diner. And it turns out... This is a Christian movie, so I'll give you guys one guess to figure out what it is. That's right, it's cancer! Yeah, it's cancer. We believe it's cancer. No. Dead. But Bart's dad doesn't tell Bart about the cancer. And perhaps that's maybe because he's a little upset that Bart didn't tell him about his musical. Actually, I was looking at your name on an advertisement for a play. Sorry, Dad. Oh, I should have invited you. Oh, don't, don't talk, talk about it later. It's fine. Just let me drive you home. Oh, so. you, you take care of your pretty girl there. Once again, I find myself taking the dad side. I mean, it, it is it is a little sad and kind of rude that Bart didn't invite him. Right? And now you see the character flaw. Touché. Though, is that really a good character flaw? He... He didn't invite his dad to a thing. I never said it was good. I hate that you're making me defend this movie. I never used the word good about this film. I'm just saying that you're complaining about feelings that you're supposed to be having. I refuse to feel emotions. Okay? Go to commercial.
So Bart is uh, now going to church, and the dad, once again, gives him some great life advice that I have to agree with, but the movie, I don't think, wants you to agree with it. What if I want to sing? I'd rather just sing. Stop that, stop that. You're not going into a song while I'm here. You need to find something you're good at that you can actually earn a living at because you're going to have to support yourself one of these days. Probably going about this the wrong way, but... I don't think he's wrong. All I hear out of you is whining and moaning. Part of going about it the wrong way is probably whenever the dad does this. Yeah, that, that's definitely a parenting no-no. Then we have Why? this goodwill hunting situation that's- Where is this coming from? Kind of out of nowhere. Just take the movie's word that this is what Bart always does. Got me all figured out. You push everyone away. Don't add me to that list. I love you. I'm oh yeah, you're right. You. When did we ever get the indication that he was somebody who just pushed people away? He's been dating the same girl since he was in elementary school. <laughs> you gotta write the scene so that it makes sense. You can't just have somebody say, you've always been this way, when there's no indication that they've ever been that way. I love you. I've always loved yeah, well, you. I've never really loved you. <gasps> I can't stay here, Shane. And he leaves his girlfriend symbolically in the same place his mom left him. Do you get it? Do you, get, do, do you understand? All right, so now it's six months later from whenever that was. And then we get another completely out of nowhere scene where he's somewhere, I don't even know where, and he's just like, hey, could I join your band? If you guys need a singer, I'll sing. Who are you? Yeah, exactly. Who is he? Who are these people? So he joins the band because obviously that's what he needs to do because that's what the movie's about. We're here to see Mercy Me become Mercy Me, all right? Don't pussyfoot around. I guess getting hit in the head with a plate is the motivation that he needed. Then, as Bart is singing, Trace Your Steps, Trace Atkins walks in. Trace your steps the way you were before. Did someone say Trace? <laughs> do you think that... Little pun is on purpose? I can't imagine it was. I mean, I can't only imagine it was. Well, if it was, then please let me be the first to acknowledge to the Irwin brothers, I noticed. Those are the types of Easter eggs I'm here to find on Say Goodnight, Kevin. But Trace Atkins is none too impressed with this you know 90s grunge music. Story. I guess he knows it's on its way out. But then, just as Trace Atkins is walking out, is Bart is inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell the story from the trailer. And I found some songs I held on to, like an anchor in a storm. This inspires the band to play a super generic worship song. Oh Lord, you're beautiful, our this child. This child right here, this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. The song that is so simplistic that the whole band was able to just start playing it at random without rehearsal at all. That's the song that gets Trace Atkins to turn around and take a second glance. I didn't know you were coming. Thank you. Yeah, well, I did. Merry Christmas. And what's the name of your band again? Uh, it's Mercy Me, you know, because when I when I told my mama that we were starting a band, she was like, Mercy Me, you get a real job. And then the guys were like, did she really say that? And I was like, yeah, we, we have to name the band Mercy because that's what we called it. Son, the sheer volume of words that comes out of your mouth is exhausting. Oh great, now we get another personality change in Bart. Seriously, him being a hyperactive, talkative person is a completely brand new aspect to this character. So he's well-rounded! Hey, hey, whoa, dude, dude, we keep things politically correct around here, all right? No more fat jokes. I don't think you found your song. Look, that last thing you did, that was... That was special. You should do that the whole time. Just do that crap the whole time. Everybody will love it. Write something like that and then give me a call. You need a catchy melody that's so generic and nondescript that it can be played on literally every radio station for years and years and years to come. Jeez, Kevin, you really hate this song. No, I, I don't hate the song. I just kind of hate people's love for the song? Did this song hurt you, Kevin? Do you need to talk about it? Did this song rape your mother? You gotta go with us. We got plenty of room on the bus. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, I need to get another job. But then they stopped to see his girlfriend. Oh yeah, his girlfriend. I forgot about her. Long time no see, you look great. What are you thinking coming here like this? I don't know, I didn't really think about it. I don't wanna go on any more adventures with you. She will not be joining us. 
Shocker. <sighs> well, ain't she the smart one? <laughs> so then Bard is inspired to write a song that literally completely rips off the song that they sang that one night. But it's not quite their song yet. But their new manager believes in them enough to schedule them for GMAs. <laughs> what? It's GMA week. What, what is that? It's only the biggest convention in music. What I need you to do is invite every youth group you can. That's true. Kids love the opportunity to go on a youth trip with the hopes that they might get to make out in the back with the girl that they kind of like. And then just do what you did tonight. No! <laughs> wow, he really is going to show his dad when he plays gospel music week. Happiest place on earth. Part of me wanted to criticize the fact that this is aerial footage from within the last few years. Then I realized there's probably not a lot of HD aerial footage of Nashville in 1991, so I'll give it a pass. And then, Bart meets. Get ready, are you ready? Michael W. Smith. I am like a huge fan from like all the, uh, sorry, like so good. all yeah, the yeah. way back, way back. And Amy Grant. Oh man, <laughs> what? Miss Bart, I'm, oh. You okay? I just threw up a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm good. I just, you were like, the first Christian tape I ever got was Never Alone. And it was like... You see what I'm talking about? How in love this movie is with Christian music? It's like this movie has to overemphasize the importance of these Christian artists so that Bart's dream doesn't seem like a huge mistake and it seems like something his dad was wrong about. Again, I think it's just saying that these people were important to Bart, which they were. Let me put it another way, okay? Imagine. I'm imagining. I can only be imagining. Imagine if they made a movie about me because I had some viral video. I know this is all wishful thinking, but you know what? Maybe my dreams will pay the bills. Then, in the movie, they make this huge deal about the time I met David A.R. White or collaborated with the cinema snob. Uh, okay. I see what you're saying. And I understand that this is important to him. It just feels so inside baseball and the movie doesn't even realize it. At some point, you have to acknowledge that yes, this is important to this character, but we understand as the movie makers that this is not necessarily going to resonate with everyone. Ever feel like everything in your life is just building and building and building to one big moment? Like the events of your life have been rearranged by a movie director to fit in a nice little box? Oh good, they got the producer of the movie to come and watch the band. So what did the Nashville bigwigs think of the band? Well, let's find out in the most realistic meeting with record producers ever put to film. I think we're pretty much finished up here anyway. Oh, come on, I wanna know what you think. But unfortunately, the record labels see the band for what it actually is. Another generic band that sounds exactly like Casting Crowns or Third Day or Sonic Flood. Who? Exactly! I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you this, kid, but, um, you're just not good enough. You're wrong. Does this not feel like whatever people who can't sing are on American Idol? This is about record sales, and I just can't sell what you're doing up there. What world are you guys living in? You need to embrace reality, Bart. Your stuff. You're not good enough, Bart. Dreams don't pay the bills. Oh, great. All the record label's feedback is causing him to have flashbacks to his dad. I get these same kind of flashbacks every time I read my comment section. But that being said, I am all about improving oneself to prove other people wrong. That's basically everything that's ever motivated me in my life. So you're doing a good job, Bart. Keep it up. I've got a brother-in-law in Denver. He's looking for a worship pastor. I could put you two together if you like. Is she serious? Whoa. Unnecessary dig on worship pastors. Come on, man. Who do you think helped bring all those kids to your show in the first place? Look, this guy has dreams. He's not going to settle for second best. The Christian music industry only exists because people are willing to settle for second best. Look, I work with a lot of bands and I can recognize who's going to make it and who isn't. You won't. Go home. Dad, I can do this. No, you can't. I can do no, this. No, you can't. No, you can't! You think you could do these things, but you can't, Nemo! So, turns out Bart really isn't that good at taking criticism. Well, let's just hope he never watches this review. Keep in mind, I'm talking about Bart in the movie, not Bart in real life. Wow, thanks for that useful information. You just ticked off half of Nashville in there. This is all there is? 
In Christian music? Yeah, pretty much. What? And I quit. What? No. But Trace Atkins has some advice that will truly inspire him. I'm gonna be honest with you. Maybe if you shave your hair and grow out a goatee. Yo, 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 did somebody say goatee? Sometimes when you're up there, it's like you're singing somebody else's music. Then there are times when I see something real. I see something authentic. Yes! Authenticity, that's how you're gonna make it in the Christian music industry. What are you running from? Why are you throwing temper tantrums? My dad. Then write about it. Let that pain become your inspiration. Exploit your pain. Use it for profit. And you were born this cynical? Come on, cinema snob. You gotta realize it's fine when I do it. So Bart is inspired to quit the band. I gotta go home. Wow, you really fixed that one, Trace Atkins. So he gets his hair all done up the way it was when he was back in high school and takes a visit. Though I'm not sure how all of this happened since the band started in 1994 and Bart's dad died in 1991. I guess that wouldn't make a very good movie, would it? But when Bart gets home, things have changed quite a bit, which you would think that would make Bart happy since he used to get hit in the head with plates and beat within an inch of his life, but no, Bart's not into it. I've been uh, rebuilding that Jeep of mine, and I was hoping that maybe we could uh, get it running again and go somewhere. What are you doing? Do I was just trying to make a memory. So all the memories that we have together are bad. I did some things. That night you beat me so badly? Yeah, I remember that. To be fair, you did make a pretty stupid cardboard hat that day. It tore me up. I, I cried that all night about what I did to you then. So this is actually where the movie starts to pick up for me. It starts to get to me. It really is moving to see this father and son relationship. And just a little bit, I started to get a little emotional because it shows that Bart isn't perfect and he's starting to deal with his pain. Can't you give me a chance? No! So Bart throws his dad's words back into his face. You just gotta give up on that dream, Dad, because it keeps you from this, from knowing what's real. And that's when he finds out that his dad has cancer. Okay, I'm not making fun of cancer, everybody. How many times do I have to explain this? Jeez Louise. Great, now Bart is gonna become an atheist. Is that how it happened to you, Cinema Snob? I became an atheist when I was a child. I was picked to play kickball with my friends, but then I stubbed my toe on the swing set and had to sit the game out. What kind of God would let that happen? Oh, I guess that's why you hate God! So frustrated that he can't make amends with his son, he goes and tries to tear apart the Jeep with a baseball bat. And for the first time, Bart realizes he's now stronger than his father. Just do it. Are you feeling yet? Uh, not really. <laughs> Maybe a little bit? I don't know. This just seems to come out of nowhere. If this had happened right after he had gotten hit in the head with the plate, then maybe. But we know that Bart isn't going to beat his dying dad over the head with a baseball bat here. You're a heartless bastard! And I can respect that. So he goes up into the attic and he finds his journal from camp. And we have this really powerful moment where he finally finishes his camp homework. Yeah. So he's telling Amy Grant all of these flashbacks too? Come on, Kevin, do you have to make fun of literally everything? Here this man is learning to forgive his father and you're downplaying it. Yes, that's literally what I do. I feel something, so I deflect it by making a joke so I can maintain the power in my life and never seem weak by opening up. Yeah, I can totally see why you're not relating to this character at all. Hey, what is, what is this note here? G. What, what's that note? C. C. Just one more chord and you could play pretty much every worship song. Oh, I wanted to be there. Hey there, Shannon. Don't you ever let her get away. Yeah, we're not, we're not dating anymore. What? 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 Boy, I will beat you till you can't sleep at night if you don't get back together with that girl. Whatever you did, even if you don't know what you did, you're wrong. <laughs> You know, it really is amazing that they could make just these two hanging out at the house feel way more interesting than the rest of the movie. Well, this is what the movie is about. Yeah, but that's what takes me out of the movie because then I'm always thinking, oh, well, the rest of the movie that isn't so interesting is just fluff in order to make the movie marketable. And it worked. Yes, it did. Are we agreeing or arguing right now? Because you know what? I don't care. Montage, montage of the Jeep running 
dead strings. All right, so there is this touching deathbed scene where Bart's dad tells him all the stuff that he feels he should have told him all along. And yes, it's moving. It's heart-wrenching. It's super sad. I told you not to follow your dreams. Only because mine, they, they never came true. You sing a song, son. Amazing. No, no, what are you Grace. doing? You're singing Amazing Grace? Everybody knows that that's a funeral song. Don't sing that. Ah, oh, great. That's when he gets one more brilliant idea that he steals from his grandmother. Imagine what he's seeing up there, Bart. Just imagine. That's right, every great idea that Bart Millard ever had, the name of his band, and his hit song came from his grandmother. <laughs> and with perfect timing, that's when the band comes and picks him up. They waited for him. I'm sure all those gigs that they played without a lead singer left a lot of youth groups really confused. Hey guys, my dad died. I know what to write about now. Well, dad got sick. I got a bat. I didn't bash his face in. How about that? Aren't I great? So then, Bart Millard opens up his journal. He notices words he's written before. That's it. A song that says, I can only imagine over and over and over. Brilliant. Okay, God. Okay. That's right. You can't criticize this song. It comes directly from God. I haven't been on stage since I lost my dad. And, and I deal with it the only way I know how. Decapitating squirrels. Well, I'm gonna sing it for you now. This is called I Can Only Imagine. So the song gets recorded and Michael W. Smith gives it a listen. And he can't believe how amazing this amazing song is. <laughs> wow. Uh, no. All right, cut back to Amy Grant still not believing Bart. You didn't write this song in 10 minutes. Judging by how long it took you to tell me this story, I don't think you do anything in 10 minutes. Not dealing with a friend. Oh my gosh, battle. that was Amy Grant the whole time? I could, I didn't even, I, I, I can't believe it. I literally can't even believe it. Yeah, you're right. The movie thought the reveal was way more exciting than it was. And I know some songs can be real personal. Is this what you really want? Yes, yes, obviously this is what I want. I barely have enough money to feed my family, please. Then he finishes his trailer voiceover. My dad was a monster, and I saw God transform him into the man I wanted to become, and I didn't realize it soon enough. Okay, um, we're burning up studio time here. Uh, are you guys gonna do the song or not? Yes. Amy needs a comeback song. We believe this is it. Look, we lost a lot of our Christian audience after the whole Gary Chapman situation, so we need a super blatantly Christian song to get them back on board. <laughs> oh, great, now we're back where the movie started. And that's when we find out that Bart's dad was really his other personality this whole time. So we cut to Amy Grant's concert, where Bart and his giant head wait for her to perform I Can Only Imagine. I heard this song and it just blew my soul wide open. It rescued me. It died for my sins. And you're the first ones to ever hear it. But in that totally real moment that really happened, Amy Grant, she just can't perform the song. Ladies and gentlemen, the writer of this song is here tonight and Bart, come on up. Whoa, whoa wait, what? So she calls Bart up on stage to sing it instead? It's not just a song that's special, it's you. I don't know if I've made it clear enough that you're basically Jesus, Bart. It's your so with those three beautiful notes, Bart Millard sings his song. I can only imagine. All right, there are two things that this movie really has going for it. This lead actor, I think, sings better than the real Bart Millard. I can only imagine. And second, the cinematography is just fantastic. It, it looks so good. Very, very impressive. And of course, the sound design is really good too. I better be getting a cut for this. Okay, well, I'm getting a little sick here from spinning around, okay? Can we, can we slow down a bit? Wow, uh, was I right? Yeah, cinema snob. It turns out the whole movie is just Bart's fever dream after he got hit in the head with the plate. <laughs> and that song is their first single, and I want all y'all to keep an eye out for it, okay? Oh, what? Adrian! Remember, th this is the girl from camp, remember? I've always loved you. <laughs> I sat there. Pondering, wondering, had this movie earned the second Star Wars reference? Then I realized I needed to wrap this review up because it's like 
over 40 minutes long now. Then the song blows up. Apparently the next day, I guess. Here's a new song for you on Magic 104.5. Uh, guys? It's the number one Christian song in America now charting on country and pop charts as well. I, I think we just blew through five years of when the song released to whenever the song blew up on the radio because of 9-11. Mention all of Mercy Me's credentials yet? Wow. Well, that's the movie. I, I wonder what happened to the mom. I can only imagine. That's the title. All right, so there you go. I can only imagine. And Cinema Snob, I hope you can finally understand how this movie isn't the greatest movie of all time like apparently everybody seems to think it is. Wow, you really convinced me. When this review started, I thought the movie was fine. And now you brought me all the way down to indifference. <laughs> Way to go. Really? Yeah, sure. But more than that, I've come to realize why you hate this movie so much. Because it's an emotionally manipulative money grab that uses cheap cliche plot devices to self-congratulate the Christian media industry? <laughs> no. Uh, because it changes so much from the real story to fit in its own little neat box, which on the surface seems completely harmless because what? Every movie changes characters in order of events so that it'll work within a film until you realize that the movie is trying to say that God did all these things and then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Well, if that's not exactly how it happened, then it wasn't God, it was the people who made the movie, as you can clearly read in the book that they put out alongside the film. Hmm, there's a book? Uh, yeah. I read the whole thing. I highly recommend it if you want to find out the real story and if you want to know how much they changed for the film so that it would make you believe that there was this big come to Jesus moment for Bart and it made everything better in his life, which is kind of how the movie goes where it's like everything's bad, everything's really bad, and then everything's good and his dad's better and uh, he has this hit song all because he learned to forgive his father. Okay, enough already. You hate this movie because you love this movie. No, I don't. What? Yeah, you love it. You hate it because you're Bart and that makes you uncomfortable. Hold on, whoa. Are you saying that I'm not the unbiased critic that I always thought that I was? Are you saying that I inject my opinions into my critiques? This whole time you've been giggly and making obscure references to people even I've never heard of. You seem to know way too much about Christian music and you even read the book for God's sake. For research? Dude, you hate this movie like a Star Wars fan hates Solo. I thought it was perfectly fine. Like a mother taking her eight-year-old to go see Solo. It's me not caring that made me sit back and say, hey, well, at least it didn't feel like bamboo shoots under my fingernails. At least it wasn't one of those victim complex God's Not Dead movies or an End Times movie that's a pile of dog crap and uses 30 frames per second or one of those Christian love stories that makes you wait until you're 80 years old to have sex, this movie had a message that I could totally get behind. And that message is to not be an asshole. Yeah, I, I guess that is a pretty good message. It's everything you've been asking for in a movie. Well-produced, cohesive story, good acting, and it has a message of grace and forgiveness. I thought you were all about that crap. I guess it was pretty inspiring whenever he chose not to murder his cancer-ridden dad with a baseball bat. Well, it was fine. All right, Cinema Snob, you've convinced me. I guess this movie is the greatest film of all time, just like you're saying. A hundred percent not what I'm saying. Well, there you have it, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Sega Night Kevin. Big thank you to Cinema Snob for joining me and doing so much work in order to uh, to be a part of this show. I had a lot of fun with them and hopefully we'll work again in the future. That would be great. Big shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're the ones who make this show happen. If it wasn't for them, then I would be at work right now instead of recording this awesome episode. Some of those people happen to be the Religious Nut and Hellbound Sinner podcast, the Defenders of Liberty podcast and YouTube channel. Go check them out in the link below. Jacob and Emily Rugrock and Amanda Stewart. Plus all the people listed who pledged 20 dollars or more and many many more all right that's all i've got to say i'm kevin holding christian movies up to the same standard as other films good night because for me you know without the song you know it's it's all about the song